and welcome back to uh, Bill of Rights Institute's Primary Source Closure Reads. Today, we're going to take a little bit different tact. If you've been on the channel before, we look at different primary sources every week. Um, this week, we're actually going to look at three. Uh, we're coming close to the end of the year here, um, and we have the opportunity to kind of go back and think about all those documents we wish we would have gotten to. Uh, and to help me with that today, I am fortunate to be joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Tony Williams and Josh Schmidt. Hi, guys. Hey, Kirk. Hi, Kirk. How are you doing? Good. So as it turned out, we picked these documents at random, just things we wish we would have gotten to, and we've chronologically spread them out uh, across American history. So we're going to start with the, um, the causes and necessities of taking up arms from 1775. We're going to look at Abraham Lincoln's Young Men's Lyceum Address from 1838. And then we're going to wrap up by looking at Harry Truman's announcement of the surrender of Japan from 1945. Um, and what I think is interesting about these documents is that as we look at them, again, we pulled them at random, but there are similar themes. Um, and I wondered, you know, we've all had a chance to kind of glance at these documents, but did that surprise either of you guys, or are you kind of picking up on a theme of these, uh, these broadcasts that there's certain themes that we're kind of pulling out of these documents? Yeah, it surprised me. Like we, we didn't coordinate at all, really, minus trying to pick things out, um, in different, uh, time periods. But yeah, the fact that there are common themes is surprising. I, I, yeah, I might have been a little less surprised just in the sense that even though across time and across space, uh, whether in the revolution or in the 19th century or into the 20th century and sort of world wars that, you know, they're, they're grappling with themes of, you know, what it means to be an American, what it means to live freely, uh, thinking about our principles, thinking about the health of our democracy and our, our civic culture. So uh, it's, in my mind, maybe not a surprise that, that these are perennial issues that, that Americans uh, have examined over time. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's right. I think there's, there are things that emerge from cultures when societies and people get together. And it's why I think history is important. It's why studying these things, studying these themes and these concepts and these questions continues to yield uh, so many interesting aspects uh, and allows us to continue to go down different paths and think about things in different ways. Um, so with that, let's take a look at our first document. Right. So as we mentioned, we've got three documents from three different periods of American history um, that we all picked just because they are interesting and exciting. And we're not ashamed to talk about our excitement about uh, primary source documents around here. So um, as you see, they span time period, like we mentioned. Um, and so let's just dive right in uh, the causes and necessities of taking up arms. So um, this document was passed by the Continental Congress as sort of a plea uh, to the British Parliament and King uh, about, and, and I guess to the world too, which I think is interesting. So often, and this is why I picked this, so often we look at July 4th, 1776 and the Declaration of Independence as this moment when America emerged and stated its principles for being free. Um, and we know some stuff happened with like the Stamp Act and the Sugar Act and all these kind of things. Um, and, and all that stuff built up to July 4th, 1776, they passed the Declaration of Independence and that is the moment that we declared everything. Um, but the reason that this document to me is so profound is this is a year before independence. Uh, it comes several months after uh, Lexington and Concord have taken place. So there has been violence. Um, things have been escalating in the colonies. And here you see the colonists, Continental Congress, coming together as subjects of the crown to plead their case to the world, uh, which they announced in the first paragraph, a pleading their case to the world about why it is that they find themselves suddenly um, in rebellion against the crown or and for them it wasn't necessarily rebellion so much as it was them staking out their position within the empire in this first section that i pulled i think kind of speaks to that because it's you can imagine yourself writing this kind of document saying you know like okay i'm spelling all this out and then you get to a point where you're like well why am i doing this well i gotta tell you why well here's why i'm here's why i'm telling you about how these all these awful things that have been taking place um, because if we don't do something about it even worse things are going to happen uh, so Tony, is that, did I get the history right there? Is that, is that approximately uh, what was going on? And, um, and, and I guess, what, what do you think about this when you pick up this document? What, what really speaks to you? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the colonists are at war, right? And so there's that year long period, roughly a little bit more uh, in which they're at war and, and, and yet they're still not an independent nation. So all, you know, they're, they're trying to grapple with their place 
you know, in the British Empire, do they want to stay? They're at war. Uh, and, and they're telling the British and the world, as you said, why they were sort of forced to take up arms. And the answer is pretty obvious from a study of American history in, in the revolution is to defend their sacred liberties and, and to defend their natural rights uh, against what, what they saw as British tyranny. Uh, and those armies going to war against the colonists are probably no greater evidence of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to that point, they, they say here too, look, this isn't new. We for 10 years incessantly and ineffectually besieged the throne as supplicants. We reasoned, we remonstrated with parliament in the midst of most mild and decent language, right? Like they're, you can feel when you read this document, like they're at, they're at their wits end about what they can do. They're trying, they're pleading their case. They're really putting it forward. Look, we want representation. We want um you know, we want to be heard and we're trying to make this work, uh, but we're seemingly running into uh, these challenges. Um, and Josh, I mean, I know that, that you look a lot of history and you try, you look at these themes and things. Um, and, you know, I guess in looking at this document, what is it to you that kind of like jumps out that, that says, yeah, like this is, this is, you know, we're not to independence. They're still trying to couch their terms, but, um, but what are they, I guess, are the colonists justified in kind of taking this approach? What do you think? Well, depends on if you're a loyalist or not, I guess I would say. But um, if you're, yeah, if you're a patriot, they, they make a, a solid argument. Um, they're, they're starting to invoke uh, consent of the governed. That's one theme that I see. Uh, not a single man of those who assume it is chosen by us. And um, also just this idea of limited government or rule of law. Uh, such a so enormous so unlimited a power um, they're they're referring to that uh, I can't remember what it's called Tony you can help me but the the declaration that parliament made that basically said they can make whatever law they deem to be necessary uh, what was that called again Tony uh, seven, 1766 declaratory act yeah. okay yeah yeah so um that's, that's what stood out to me here is that uh, the, the patriots are making their case. Of course, they're doing it and then uh, explaining why they're fighting, which is a very American thing to do, I think. And I, I think they're making a really solid case here. Yeah, and it sort of tees up, you know, next year's document, which is, you know, when in the course of human events, um, it becomes necessary to abolish the bonds. You know, they, they're... they're that, that that phrase, I think, from the Declaration of Independence becomes even more profound when you begin to read these other documents that show, look, they're they're at least giving lip service to trying trying to get to this place. Um, and I included the rather long conclusion here um, because I think it's so powerful how they how they wrap this up. And I think you're right, Josh. Like they're they're pulling on representative government, they're pulling on the rule of law, they're pulling on all these things that they identify. Uh, you know, as being important. And these were questions that had come up in the colonies. So not just in the 10 years that they'd been dealing with um, all these different acts in, in Britain trying to raise their taxes, but even before that, during the, uh, during the, the French and Indian War, you have revolts of uh, different militias, you know, continental militias, not wanting to be a part of the crown because they didn't feel they were getting their contracts recognized in the way that they needed to. I mean, you know, this is sort of deeply seated um, uh, part of their, uh, political culture and part of their societal culture. And, you know, this conclusion to me really speaks to like them drawing a line under this. Um, and it, it always sort of takes me back, you know, in defense of the freedom that it is our birthright in which we never enjoyed to late violation of it for the protection of our property acquired solely by honest, the honest industry of our forefathers and ourselves against violence actually offered, we have taken up arms. So they're positioning themselves. And this is, you know, if you are more on the loyalist side, it, you can kind of like roll your eyes and say, look, you know, we're only responding to the violence that you've put on us. But I think that from the perspective of the Continental Congress here, again, in 1775, actually this violence has happened. They're saying, look, we keep making this case. And they do this in the first paragraph. We keep making the case about what it is for us to be truly a part of this empire. And we are now forced to take up arms to defend ourselves because none of those petitions are being heeded. Um, and we're now putting out our, our case to the world uh, in hopes that not only is it recognized, but that 
you know, that, 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 that the world will understand what it is that's actually going on here in the colonies. Yeah, what, what stands out to me here is how they're, they're framing this as a very limited battle. Um, they're, they're not doing it. We fight not for glory or for conquest. They're basically saying, look, we're just trying to defend our homeland. We're not trying to um, expand our borders or um, anything like that. We don't even want to separate from Great Britain, I say at this point. So we're only a year away from the release of the Declaration of Independence. But even at this point, they're saying, you guys are attacking us. And so we're just trying to defend our lives. Um, but we don't want to leave yet because they, they see more benefit in staying than in being independent. Yeah, that, that line, our friends and fellow subjects really jumps out at me compared to the document, you know, a year later, the Declaration of Independence. Um, the other one that does too is the very end, you know, thereby to relieve the empire from the calamities of civil war, right? I think oftentimes, you know, we think about the American Revolution in the terms of it was a fight for independence, um, but seeing it in 1775 as a civil war or a strife within a society, I think is, is really interesting. What do you make of that, Tony? Yeah, you see this, this kind of terminology referred to constantly over, over the previous decade uh, in, in the sort of resistance movement, uh, where, they, where they talk about their British brethren, uh, their brother, their brothers, they're, you know, talking about the mother country, uh, and, and they still see themselves as part of the British Empire, and they just want to be good subjects, but just not have their rights violated. As you see in the second paragraph, they talk about protecting their freedom, their property, uh, and, and protecting themselves against violence, right? Their, their lives. Um, and uh, they just want to restore that proper relationship between the colonies and Great Britain. Yeah, absolutely. And I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but um, this document was written by Thomas Jefferson and then edited by John Dickinson. Um, and John Dickinson is interesting uh, in that he voted against um, the Declaration of Independence. He, he voted against the dissolution of the Union with Britain um, and, and was against that move in 1776, um, even though he had been a leading advocate against British policies throughout the 1760s and into the 1770s. And here is writing um, what is pretty dramatic language, but um, but that's a different story for another day. I only had a few minutes here that I could go into my document, um, but, but I'm glad I could share with you guys. This is, again, one of those things that I, I just, I love taking the Declaration of Independence and giving it a little bit more context. Um, and I think this is one of those documents that does it. Um, but with that, Tony, we'll move further into the, uh, or we'll move into the 19th century. Um, and I'll turn it over to you to, to talk us through um, Abraham Lincoln's uh, Young Man's Lyceum Address. Right. Well, uh, the, the context of this is, is Lincoln is a, is a relatively young man at the time, and a, and a lyceum would be a place of uh, listening to lectures and engaging in uh, friendly uh, intellectual debates of current events and, and, and other issues. Uh, it's sort of a, a place of collegial learning, if you will, sort of going back to classical Greece, uh, and, and, and Plato and Aristotle and so forth. And, and the context of the speech also uh, in, the, in the larger society is that there's a lot of passions being unleashed. Or there's a lot of anger. Uh, there's a lot of immoderation because of uh, the anti-abolitionist mobs. Uh, P, uh, actual members of Congress are, are fighting each other in the halls of Congress. Um, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, a, a lot of kind of mob rule and, and anger, especially over uh, slavery and its expansion out West, uh, you know, what was going on uh, down in Texas and it, its conflict with, with Mexico uh, and the possible ramifications of that. So, so there's just a, a lot of contention in, in society. And I chose it because we seem to be experiencing that same kind of contention, right? And that kind of rise of passions and immoderation and sort of unwillingness to compromise. And, and you see this on social media. Uh, unfortunately, you see it among a, a lot of our politicians and their inability to compromise. And it just seems that we're increasingly maybe a, a little less able to 
have civil conversations uh, about current events. Uh, and they were in many ways no different uh, than, than us. Uh, and so Lincoln in this address uh, is appealing to reason. He's appealing to restraint and moderation and trying to listen you know, to the other person's uh, point of view um, and, and have a little less passion, right? He wants uh, reason to be the underpinnings of a more restrained approach, uh, a more willingness to compromise uh, and that this can affect not only our politics of the day, uh, but also our civic culture as well. Uh, Kirk or um, Josh, do you see uh, any of that in, uh, in this particular paragraph? Yeah, I think what stands out to me is something that Josh said last time, right? Which is this continued tradition of, of the rule of law too and, and what that means, right? And, and that, that giving the parameters around which we can compromise, which is something that Lincoln talks about um, later in the Lincoln, Lincoln Douglas debates. Um, but, but this idea that, you know, let the reverence for the laws be breathed by every American mother to the lips, the, lis, the lisping babe um, that prattles on her lap, let it be taught in schools and seminaries and in colleges. Uh, that, that, to me, that's such a powerful line that, that speaks to what you're talking about, Tony, because it, it, gives, it gives the opportunity for this, this thing to be clear that we can all appeal to and understand to give context to the arguments and the conversations and the discussions that we have in the hopes of creating that atmosphere in which we can have productive conversation that moves away from violence and towards something more ennobled or higher or, or, or uh, I guess, better, um, which you know just really jumps out to me. Any thoughts, Josh? Yeah, what uh, stands out to me is this is a good um, over 20 years before the Civil War, but uh, this is obviously uh, referencing the slavery issue that's already dividing the country so, so much. And um, what's really going to uh, eat away at Lincoln, as well as other more moderate abolitionists, is how can we balance this rule of law with um, the injustice of slavery? So if if the laws are protecting slavery through things like the, the fugitive slave clause of the constitution, um, the state's ability to re regulate slavery and not the national government, um, at least in the states, not in the territories, how, how can we balance that out? How can we try to bring an end to slavery in a lawful way, or at least as lawful as we can. Right, and you know, I think uh, both of you are on, uh, definitely uh, on the right track here because I think what Lincoln is saying is that let's trust in American democratic institutions. Let's trust in the rule of law. Let's trust that these things will support just greater justice, greater equality, greater liberty, uh, and that we can therefore trust in the deliberative process of democracy. Uh, and, and sometimes it's slow, right? Uh, but but it, it'll work and, and we can get to that, that place of justice and equality and, and liberty and, and these constitutional natural rights principles. Uh, but we have to trust in the process. We have to trust in the institutions and, and we all need to, to abide by this rule of law. And so if we can go to the, the next slide, I think there's, there's one more paragraph from this. And I think, as we said before, Lincoln sees, uh, you know, the problem rooted in, in passions and people just following their feelings and, and not trusting in the process, not trusting in the institutions, being unwilling to compromise, being imprudent in how they go about things. And, and that this, he sees this as, as unproductive to engage in this kind of mob rule, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, injustice uh, in, in the South uh, related to the horrible treatment of slaves uh, and, and lynchings and so forth, or uh, on the other side with sort of the, the impassioned uh, anger against, uh, you know, uh, 
abolitionists with with uh, throwing their their printing presses into rivers and and even some were were, were killed. Uh, but then also on the other side, uh, you know, the unwillingness of, of people like William Lloyd Garrison and other abolitionists who felt they were so right in their principles that they were just unwilling to compromise. Uh, you know, what, what Lincoln says is this, this is not always prudent. This is not always the right way to go, that sometimes it's better to have what he calls reason, cold, calculating, unimpassioned reason, right? That's, that's what's going to furnish the materials for a more democratic approach, a healthier civic culture, a healthier civil society, and deliberative process, right, and, and lawmaking to achieve justice, to achieve American principles. And we're going to do that more through reason than sort of these unmitigated, uh, unfiltered passions and, and anger and frustration. Yeah, and you can see him sort of channeling that Madisonian understanding of, of government, right? James Madison, the Federalist Papers famously talks about um, the challenges of passion. But here, I think it's interesting that he, he couches it and says, look, passion has helped us, uh, but can do so no more, right? Like, the, the, and I think oftentimes that's something that's overlooked. And one of the reasons why I find this Lincoln speech here so profound is it's, it, it's not, reason isn't intended to replace passion completely, right? I think passion is important, calling attention to to topics and ideas that are are that we feel necessary are needed change in society and everything else, I think it needs to be there. I think what what Lincoln, at least to me, seems to be arguing here is that it needs to be tempered, and we need to understand. Look, you know, we've all been had our moments where we get angry about something, we're frustrated with something, but it's when we're able to take a step back from that and analyze it and figure out the best way forward that we actually make progress. Um, and 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 Lincoln here is saying, look, that. Doing that takes some architecture around us. It takes some habits. It takes some practices. Um, it takes some 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 learning. Um, but when we're able to do that, we're able to move towards um, the best ends that we can possibly possibly move towards. What stood out to me is that last line referencing Washington. So trying to to find the great unifier during this time. Um, and really Washington has been uh, always the person that Americans turn to even in the modern day, um, that he's the, the first American. And really we, um, even if we find some flaws with him as there are flaws with all historical figures, we're, we're able to see him as kind of this representative of the, the greater American experiment. Yeah, I think it's rooted in Washington's character, right? His his virtuous character of of that that sobriety and that calm uh, and that reason. And and Washington certainly certainly struggled with his uh, temper at times, even during the American Revolution. But he tried to exercise self control. He tried to be calmer. He tried to show restraint so that you know he could see the other side, right? He could see. Uh, a more deliberative way uh, to go about things. And, and I think that's uh, the great appeal of Washington here. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Tony. This is a fun one. Again, wish we could have gotten to it uh, earlier in the year, but, uh, but I think it's a great one to bring up now. Um, and now we'll take sort of a different tack, jump way up into the future, 100 years, over 100 years after Lincoln's address, um, and take a look at Harry Truman's announcement of the surrender of Japan on September 2nd, 1945. So, so Josh, Tony, and I both picked sort of these uh, these political rooted in political history and and in constitutional structures. You picked something something different. So what's going on with this document? Yeah, what what I find really interesting about this document is, while it might not necessarily be rooted in politics, it's still rooted in uh, American ideals to some extent. So Truman starts off uh, talking in about kind of the more um, less ideals, more just realism about why the war is fought. So um, Tokyo, or, uh, Japan attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. Uh, they started this and we ended this is basically what he is saying. And um, just the, the simplicity of that, which um, I think that's really why World War II even to this day, stands along with the Civil War as kind of the, the good war, the good fight that, that America 
joined in. Um, it was a battle between uh, against aggression, both by the Japanese and the Germans. And we stood up both for ourselves, but also for these broader ideals of freedom, uh, liberty of the individual, um, rescuing these other countries that had been taken over by, by aggressive, uh, the aggressive Germans, Italians, and Japanese. So, and he, you can really start to see uh, some of these ideals coming out. He's, he's referring to civilization and civilized. So um, that's going to come out more though in, in the next section that we have. So Tony, Kirk, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I, I honed in myself on the word civilized, right? And civilization, because I think it implies certain things, right? Uh, and in the 20th century, it, um, you know, it, it, it represented the, the stark moral difference between those aggressive totalitarian militaristic powers that were trying to take over big chunks of the world, impose their system, led to millions of deaths, uh, and those countries that were were defending uh, the ideals, uh, you know, of, of natural rights and and of, of democracy and and of freedom, and uh, you know, there there's also though at the end of the war, you know, a magnanimity here that we're not going to just crush Japan, Japan and and impose this draconian peace on them, but we're going to be magnanimous in victory. Uh, we're going to help them in Germany rebuild. Uh, and we're going to support greater civilization here after this very destructive war. So it, it's a defense of civilization during the war, uh, but then also a defense of civilization uh, in rebuilding as well. Yeah, and, and what strikes me too is from, from a less, I guess, uh, sort of high ideal kind of perspective and just from the rhetoric of the speech, right? I mean, it, Truman is, true, is, is clearly trying to send a particular message here um, and he's doing it through symbols. Um, he mentions lots of locations here. He, he's making it very concrete. Um, even his final sentence, you know, we shall not forget Pearl Harbor. The Japanese militarists will not forget the USS Missouri, right? These, these two clear symbols of what naked aggression means, which is implied to be, you know, that uncivilized you know, attack that's taking place. This isn't the way that the world ought to work. It's not the way that we want it to work. Um, and, and then this final like symbol of the USS Missouri, this sort of symbol of resistance and resilience um, that comes into Tokyo Bay where the, the actual surrender papers are signed. And that being sort of this sign of, of a new dawn, you know, for lack of a better word, approaching and, 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 um, in welcoming sort of what this piece is going to mean for the rest of the world. I think it's, it's just really, you know, like you said, tightly constructed and, and clear and simple and yet powerful, I think, in the way that it's put together. Definitely. Yeah, let's, let's get to that next passage. So this is where uh, Truman's really going to uh, hone in on that that idealistic side, I think. So he's he's going to talk about liberty. The line that really stood out to me is, "Liberty does not make all men per perfect, nor all societies secure, but it has provided more solid progress, happiness, and decency for more people than any other philosophy of government in history." So he's really bringing out the the benefits of liberty here for a flourishing human society. And by liberty, I think uh, he, he's invoking broader American ideals, not just the freedom to do what you want, but I think also the ideal of limited government, the ideal of rule of law. You can't have liberty without a stable government. You just need to make sure that that's uh, a limited government. And so I think what in part makes World War II still the, the good fight, as I referenced earlier, is that we were able to combine this idealistic war with uh, more realism, realistic war of we were attacked, we're going to fight back. So it really helped the U.S. that we weren't just it. We were fighting against aggression, but 
we were fighting against this totalitarian aggression. So we were able to really portray this and I think to a, a very valid, um, to a very valid extent of, it's not just self-defense, we're also doing it for other people. And it really helps that doing it for other people is also in our own interest of self-defense. Right, and you know, I also think that as we look at the Declaration of Independence uh, and our, our earlier document, it's not just an expression of, of the American mind or of American ideals, but really of universal ideals. Then we also recognize that, that Truman uh, in the United States are, are speaking on behalf uh, of of all the Allied powers, right? Uh, and we could we could name several: Britain and France and and, and China and many other countries. Uh, who, you know, there's a recognition that there's a yearning in human nature. There's a universal yearning uh, for these principles of, of liberty and, and self-governance and, and democratic liberalism. Uh, so, so they're not just American ideals, but they're really uh, an appeal to the universal uh, in the human person. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what stands out to me and actually kind of links our documents today as we're moving closer to our conclusion here, um, this line uh, before the one you read, Josh, says those principles provide the faith, the hope and the opportunity uh, which help men to improve themselves in their lot, um, which to me, I think is consistent throughout each of these documents. None of the documents that we read today, I think, have said, look, if we do this, we therefore have immediate success and wealth and prosperity and everything's perfect. Um, but it's instead an opportunity to make the world in a way that benefits the most amount of people. Um, and he says that, you know, it's that this system has provided more solid progress and hap happiness and, and decency, decency, another interesting word, um, uh, for more people than any other philosophy of government in history. Um, and it's, uh, to me, that's powerful because each of these documents has talked about the potential that is had in following these principles, but that potential requires action on our own behalf in us doing things within our own societies to make it so. All, the, all this governing system does is provide the opportunity to leverage the, the beauty in, in, in nature of what it means to be a human being, um, but that requires something of us, and I think that that's always important to keep in mind, too. Um, but I think his summing it up that way is is really powerful and, and points to also to that magnet, magnanimity, Tony, um, which is a, a, a great word uh, and will, will be my SAT word for the day. Uh, but it points to that, right? Because it requires us to recognize something about human beings um, and about our own inherent equality for that thing to exist. Um, and then if you do recognize that, then that requires certain actions. And I think those actions are things that the United States has constantly strived to to get better at, sometimes rapidly, sometimes it has not done that well. Uh, but to me, putting that stake in the ground and being guided by those principles um, really does provide that faith, that hope, and that opportunity, um, you know, for men to improve themselves in their lot. That's powerful. Definitely, yeah. Um, we we were able to, as you referenced, Tony, rebuild both Japan and Germany after defeating them, and that's something really unheard of in the history of the world is uh, destroying a country, but then rebuilding it immediately. And we see what Japan and Germany are now. They're, they're both economic powerhouses and they enjoy liberty to a large extent. And that's in part thanks to uh, what the United States uh, helped them after the war. Yeah, and so with that, it brings us to our conclusion. Um, so what did you think, Guy? We all shared our, our, our documents, our overlooked documents, the ones that we wish we would have got to this year. Um, um, what do you guys think? Any final thoughts? Yeah, my only final thought is that, you know, the, the whole purpose of this discussion is to show the, the importance of primary sources, right, in the study of history and, and civics and government, uh, and to deliberate together uh, and to discuss uh, even when you don't agree perfectly, or, or maybe you do, uh, the, the whole point is to have a, a civil conversation rooted in these primary sources uh, and then see where the conversation leads you. What stood out to me is how we can see the whole process of achieving greater liberty and, and self-government has played out here. So 
we start off with the, the Revolutionary War and an attempt to um, achieve self-government just on a basic level from a, as a country as we start to form that. Then we see Lincoln here really talking about slavery. And as we know, over the next couple of decades, he, he's, he's going to really push hard to end that, that great injustice. And then with World War II, we see an attempt to, to both expand that to more of the world stage, trying to uh, help other countries um, reach self-government, but then also on, at least on the, the domestic front, the, uh, the ideals that we fought for in World War II are also going to transition in the, especially in the 1960s and the, the push to end segregation as as many people uh, point out kind of the the hypocrisy or the um, maybe not hypocrisy but the ideals don't necessarily work out when we say we're fighting for liberty for other people but then we're denying it to a large uh, segment of our population and and that's really going to help push for for greater um, liberty for African Americans here in our country. Yeah, and I think I think that ties up well with with Tony's comment about the, the importance of studying primary sources because I think these primary sources give us the opportunity to see things. We see a moment in time. We see a day when something was written and published, right? And and you can see the ideals towards which things are being written about. These are conscious choices that all of these authors are making, and the words that they're they're putting into these addresses and the way that they're framing things. Um, and we know that history is is messier than that, much more complex, much more nuanced. Um, there's highs and lows, there's, there's positives and negatives. Um, and I think keeping both of those things uh, in context with one another is really important because that's what begins to weave together this, this fabric um, that we can look at to start to pull out sort of big lessons and things we can learn and things we can follow. And I think being able to do that through primary sources is really helpful because it gives us a place to debate and discuss that's against a text and not, you know, trying to debate the interpretations of one event or another event or what people were thinking, what people were doing. You've got the words, you can debate them, you can argue over them, um, and that's healthy and that's positive, um, but they're still there at the end of the day, um, and that's and that's great. So um, so with that, we'll conclude. Josh, Tony, thank you guys both for, for joining me. Um, we'll be continuing to do these primary source close reads. We've got another one coming up in just a couple of weeks. Um, and, and we'll look forward to that. But please, if you haven't yet, like, uh, or uh, if you like this video, please like the video. Um, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please do. Um, we release, release new videos every week on all kinds of different topics, whether they're primary source close reads like this, or conversations with scholars that Tony hosts, or, um, or our colleague Mary, who looks at different image um, uh, primary sources, which is also really excellent, um, and, and pedagogical stuff too, uh, with our teacher time program and, and all kinds of stuff. Lots going on at the Bill of Rights Institute. Uh, we really hope that you'll join us um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.